You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. There's a lot of people down in Chesapeake now. Is that like a, you think that's a growing hub Mm -hmm. for fishing? Richmond, for sure. It's just Richmond. There's so many good places in Richmond. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chick Lake, the James, within 45 minutes of Richmond, there's so many 10 pounders. It's ridiculous. There's something about the ground there. I don't know what it is. Like Chesden. I I think it has to do. I mean, I also think it's the 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 culture of aluminum boats has become cool again, or it is now cool. And I feel like that's also shined some light into it because I. It's almost like when you're when you're sh- when you're shopping for a couch, you realize how many commercials there are for a couch. And then now that there's so much stuff about pimping out John boats, torpedoes, things like that, all of a sudden there's all these leagues that maybe were there that I didn't realize it because I was just in like the big boat side of things, but it seems way more prominent right now than it's ever been. I mean, mean, even with what you did with your boat and, and, um, you know, the other Matt did with his boat, like it's pretty cool what you can get done now with, with a lot less. Yeah. I mean, that's like you said, with the direction of people going from the bass boat to kayak, it's like there's all these nine 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 lakes around that people fish out of john boats it's like why not just convert to a john boat i mean i pay 25 bucks to fill up the gas tank for two trips because i got a four stroke on the boat now like oh smart yeah oh the two stroke it was like i had to fill it up every time i just put a new new uh four stroke on the on the boat and i've gone three trips i was like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> when did you get that uh, did you, like a month ago a month yeah, ago about a month ago okay I was going to say when though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Like that's something too. I've been killing. Like, I think I personally like the John boat way more than the kayak tournament trails, but, and it's because I think like, I like the fact that you can carry more shit and you can have a friend in the boat mm-hmm. with you versus kayaking. You have to be separate, but it's like getting these leagues to be more national based would be kind of cool. Not just regional. And that's the thing with kayak tournaments. Now is you can find a kayak tournament close to you. I don't, I there's not a lot of aluminum. It's very, there's a few oh, around cult, here. Is yeah. Really? So in Fredericksburg, they have the um, high voltage bass club, which is electric only, but they're all, I mean, you could fish out of a bass boat, but pretty much everybody fishes out of John boats. Then you got the RL, RLOS, which is the electric only down around Richmond, which is massive. I mean, there's like 60 boats in that one, every, every tournament. And for a, a John boat club, that's pretty big. And then you got the John boat elite down in Chesapeake. Um, then the fountainhead club. But so the Fountainhead Club is the closest one to us, though, correct? Right? And it's just Fountainhead. Yeah. Now, have you ever thought about moving down that way towards mm-hmm. like you know the Mecca? Of this? Yeah, definitely thought about it. If a job opportunity comes about, mm-hmm. that's a big thing. Yeah. Because yeah, we're we're right now looking to move to, um, and we're hoping to buy a house either this year or next year. And the biggest thing is now that this is becoming a thing is I want to move towards water. Mm-hmm. That's not just the Potomac River because mm-hmm. I've been fishing the tidal Potomac since I was like nine and I'm bored shitless of it. I would like to be near a lake and it's just, I keep telling her, it's like we're either going down towards Smith or we're going towards that Richmond area mm-hmm. because like that's the place that you have a variety mm-hmm. versus up here in Northern Virginia. Like, I'm sorry, it, it is. It's just fountainhead or the tidal that's Potomac. That's it. That's all you got. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> For bigger fisheries, it's pretty much that's all you have. I mean, Maryland, there's just those lakes up there, but they're all electric only and they don't do tournaments. They're electric only, don't do tournaments. Deep Creek is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be visiting that a lot this coming year because I just got to go up there with Matt Sell and go pike fishing. I was like, holy crap, this place. I don't know why I've never heard of this place. It's like a bass. It's awesome. It's so good. Dude, it is sick. I mean, have you ever, have you fished mm-hmm. it much? A couple, like two or yeah. three times with my buddy who fishes yeah. the Potomac. He's up there right now, actually. Ice fishing? No, they're uh, they go up. He's got a house on the lake, and uh, they go up there and ski and stuff in the oh, winter. Okay, gotcha. But he fishes in in the summer and everything. It's awesome, I and mean, it's full of grass. It's very healthy. You can punch. Mm-hmm. You can flip. You can flip deep edges. I mean, it reminds me a lot of like Lake Champlain, mm-hmm. and it's healthy too. And that's what's so it was so stupid is it's so fingery that you don't really realize like how big. It's deceptively big and it spreads anglers out Mm -hmm. because at least when we were there, we were there like early October when they were the feed bags are on and there were a ton of boats, fishing boats out there. And it really didn't feel like you're on top of each other, which was nice. And I think maybe I 
just in an abused soul because you grow up fishing the tidal Potomac where it's just everybody's always on top of each other. And it's hard to get off. But there it's really cool how it spread them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this is not trying to be like a Deep Creek Lake episode. But, yeah, it's just like one of those hidden gems that really should get more props for how good it is. But, yeah. you know, like you were saying, Maryland just sucks. There's not a lot of good fisheries. Mm -hmm. The Yakahaney is awesome, too. Which is Yakahaney. It's like 45 minutes from Deep Creek. That place is full of big smallmouth. That's another one I want to add to my to-do list for next year. And then also um, Rocky Gap. Apparently, there's supposed to be some state records in there. Rocky Gap. Allegedly. I think I've heard of that before. It's near a casino. It's electric motor only, but they stock it with trout. Mm, I know exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where that place is. I used to stop yeah. there on my way to Ohio. Rumor has it that there is a state record largemouth in there. And, I, and from the trout stocking, like just looking at the records, like it would make sense what it's feeding on. So I don't know, but that's going to be out on my list for next year. That's for sure. Live see, scope and a glide bait. It. Let's go. Or, or trout bait, man, Let's... dude. Like there's this one pond, Wilkinson, um, smack damn next to Shenandoah University. They stock that thing two times a year with trout. And you take a Huddleston or a glide bait, like a trout, and you will absolutely smoke a five to six pounder. And it's stupid that as soon as they stock those trout, those large mouths just light mm -hmm. up. They like know it. Like, I don't know when, when people say like the bass don't know the little detail and the different cycles, like shad run on the top Potomac bullshit. They do. They, they, know. they know when the dinner goes on. There's a trigger in them. They're like, yep, this is happening. So one thing that is on the, the, the old outline to do list is, you know, last year you had a lot of good tournament success. Um, you had this amazing crappie that we're going to get to as well, but I really want to just have you kind of like highlight your, you know, 2022 in a nutshell, and then where you see yourself going in 2023. Okay. Um, I guess the first tournament was the fount first fountainhead tournament, which really kicked it off. We just could not have imagined a better tournament. It was the forecast is like 13 degrees, 14 degrees in the morning. Everybody's like, Oh, this is going to suck. It's going to be cold. But we prepared for it, like cloth clothing wise, like we had body warmers on and stuff. And we go into the first tournament and we almost broke the club record. Like I had, we had, I think we had 33 and a half pounds for six fish. And I lost like a six and a half pounder that jumped three feet out of the water. And when it was 20 degrees outside and lost that one, but we started that the tournament off almost breaking the club record. And then just second tournament, I think we finished second started fishing Potomac teams right around that time. And Potomac, it was just like a comedy of errors. It was just every tournament. It was, I don't think we weighed in a four pounder until the tournament we won in August. Like we Dang. just had so many four pounders just come right next to the boat, come off, jump 30 feet away from the boat, just come off. Like it was just, it was, it was horrible. It happened every tournament. If, if multiple times in tournaments, it was, it, it was rough, but the last tournament, Luckily, we we capped it off, but yeah. Just, how like how is your execution like your execution dude, like look at your fountainhead stuff like no problems like what was I the change? Know. I don't I don't know. It wasn't even like we were breaking them off. Like it was just like I it, on a senko. I would bomb a senko out and I'd feel tick and I'd reel down and set the hook and a four pounder would come jumping out of the water and just go bloop, just spit it right off. It's like what? it was just one of those things. It's just it's fishing, man. They don't all come in the boat. No, that's true. I mean, just, yeah. When and it's, when it's your time, it's your time. Like it's just there's something yeah. about it. It's like when it's not your time, it's also not your time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the luck factor of it all. Mm -hmm. But I mean, overall, when you look at your year at a whole, it you you had some good moments, and you finished extremely high in the point standings too. Mm -hmm. Like, which is that's impressive. Yeah, it was good. I think we've that was the first year I fished with Alex. Titus, my partner from this year, because my buddy Tyler, he moved down to South Carolina and works for Shimano now. But um, yeah, we we did really well this year. We got team of the year. I think Tyler and I got team of the year twice before. Yeah, it was twice. And then Alex and I got it this last year. But we Alex and I really put things together. Just his he's always on the lake. He lives 20 minutes away. He's got his own boat. Um, and just the the combined time that he and I have put on the lake together whether that be in the same boat or him going out by himself and me fishing by myself on the same day. Like it just, it really helped put things together, just breaking down the lake on like where, where we, where we needed to be, what time of year, like halfway through the season, this 
in years past, it's taken us a tournament. So like, like I, I, I talked about this in the last podcast, it's like, there's just one point in the year where the lake kind of turns over. It's not really the turnover, but it's like the bottom section of the lake or the top section of the lake, either, or it could be vice versa. It'll just shut off. Like, it's just like the ledge fish leave the, the deep fish. They, they're not ganged up anymore. And then you just have, you just have to know when that happens and just, you got to go to the next section. And luckily Fountainhead small enough where in a day you can figure that out and be like, okay, it's time to, you can run from the top end to the bottom end in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and you can kind of dissect it in a day, but it was just th- this year we really put it together and it was, uh, yeah. I mean, guys, <laughs> if, if you think this guy's living under a rock, this is one reason I also like being in my home command post here. Uh, so you can actually get a better idea of this. Uh, let's see, March 13th, like 33.14, the 27th, 28. 23 10 i don't know what happened there you must have had look at that look at the other weights okay. though don't 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 just <laughs> knock on me look at okay so this is but, this is when for some reason this i'll explain this but if you, everybody watching if you look at the the third or the fourth fifth sixth and seventh tournament it's like when the fish go on bed if it, we had a really stable spring so like the fish went on bed and they didn't really have this we didn't have like a massive rainstorm that screwed up like a portion of the spawn so they just they got to spawn consistently so it was really sporadic and it was like you would see fish on beds especially towards the end of the day obviously when the sun pops out you can see them better and they start to move up but it was just like the our our tournament director is by far the best bed fisherman and the best spring fisherman like you can you can you can see the guy fish finished in second place those all those spawning tournaments other than one he had 950 like he won i think three of them I think there's also what's interesting about this is kind of knowing you vaguely about your style and your skill set. It really does. That's interesting now. Like, okay, once they got on beds, where you ended up being, but then once they got back into your wheelhouse, damn, you hit home runs. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, your I, pitch that you like, I like deep. <laughs> I like to fish deep. I mean, those the live scope game. Absolutely. But, um, we did have big fish in two of those spawning tournaments. So I'm not, I'm not a, a total, like I, I don't suck at fishing shallow. I promise you that, but they wouldn't eat a top water. Like normally in years past we, we'd come, we'd have way in like a 20 pound bag, maybe in the spring one or two, but we'd catch them on a frog or a buzz bait. But I can't, I think we weighed in one fish on a frog. Like and normally they destroy it out there, but nobody was catching fish on top water in the spring. For some reason it was just, you couldn't get them. You couldn't get them to bite a buzz bait or a frog or a popper or walking bait. You name it. Like they just would not touch it. That thing goes in cycles and, 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 you know, and guys, we're Josh in here, but like, you know, Matt brings up a really good point. No one's good at everything and, and everyone has to have some kind of strength in, in their game. And you can go to the extreme of like a John Cox who literally just doesn't have a transducer on his boat. But the fact is you're extremely good at, at a part of the fishing game, but then you survive when it gets out of your mm-hmm. own. That's what's so important. Cause there's so many guys that can, fish a tournament and if, if if everything lines up to the perfectly they'll do well but if it's not like that they literally bomb out and can't even like get a limit in so i think that really is a testament that you guys have you you figured out your game to an nth degree where it's like if it's in your wheelhouse you know you're thinking top five percent but if it's not you're going to survive mm-hmm. which is very important if you want to like continue on in your career yeah just consistency just like you said, it's like being in the top five. It's like, if you can stay in the top five, you don't have to win everything, but if you can be in the top five and 75% of the tournaments, you're going to go places. You'll, you'll do stuff. What makes this interesting though, is you're always fishing in the same place. And like mm-hmm. mentally, what is that like? Let's say if you're fishing a, a BFL five, five tournament thing where you're all over Virginia and Maryland, is that different mentally than if you know you're going to the exact same lake every single time? Yes. Like, does that change it? Mm-hmm. How so? I mean, you gotta you gotta think into the years of experience. N- not only myself, but the guys who've been fishing the club for the last thirty years. Like, they have all this experience. And there's people who fish Smith Mountain and Kerr and stuff with the and the Potomac the same amount of times. But it's like you can't be on these places every week unless you live like if if you live close to Kerr, you can be on Kerr every twice a week leading up to the tournament but you can't be on the potomac you know it's like you're gonna get that one day of practice it's like the res is 45 minutes from my house i get off work at one o'clock and i just boogie down there real quick and i can spend five or six hours and look around for fish it's just it's easier to stay on fish if you're fishing the same place because you can 
you can you're fishing it more i mean you just just being on the water it's everybody says that it's just time on the water so but yeah i mean there's definitely a different mindset when you have to travel i mean you got to think about the different seasons because they don't smith mountain isn't always in the spring or the pre-spawn sometimes it's spawn and but it, it all just goes back to being on the water is that hurt though like knowing a place so intimately it can absolutely because you can get you can get really frustrated with yourself because you're like okay it's march these fish should be eating a jerk bait and they won't touch it they should be at the mouth of the creeks they should be eating a spinner bait they should be doing these certain things based off of your history and then when they're not it's you can scramble but it can also really help because you can go from scrambling to saying okay let's go try this i caught him doing this two years ago and boom you start catching them so mm -hmm. yeah that that's yeah, that's really true. I, I struggle with that on the tile Potomac, that's for sure, is trying to keep a clean mind and not overthinking it, mm -hmm. which can be very, very toxic on that place. Yeah, the, the Potomac for sure. If you overthink it, it's just, just throw a freaking swim jig in the grass. <laughs> just yep. put, a, it, put it, a Senko on. It's not that it, we over we overcomplicate that place mm -hmm. to the nth degree, and you really shouldn't. And speaking of the Potomac, like so, then you know you've won you you won Fountainhead. You you mastered that place. What are your goals for 2023? Um, the Potomac, like you said, I'm gonna definitely my, me and my partner Chris Celebrity. We're gonna focus a lot on the Potomac, fishing Potomac teams, jumping in a couple of BFLs, maybe some river battles whenever we have a free weekend. Um, Anna, I'm very interested in Anna. Now, obviously, I don't know this tournament schedule and stuff. We just jumped into that last um, winter series event for the. That's the first tournament I've ever fished on Anna, and really? I've I've had terrible success on Anna. But I haven't really had the time with a bass boat and live scope and spent time idling around side scanning before. But um, Anna, I want to learn more. But really, really sticking to the Potomac. Like I just the Potomac's coming back. The, you can see it in the weights. I mean, it's it's taken much more weight to win tournaments and do well throughout the year. But focus on the Potomac and just kind of hoping to, hoping to brand myself a little bit. You're pushing me to make this YouTube channel, so I, you got a lot of knowledge. And I think the thing is, once you have your own platform, you'll realize that's where the I mean, this are worse. Like that's where the money's at. It's not about mm -hmm. winning tournaments. Like I and I know I I catch hell for this, but there's only like maybe 1% of the anglers that can just say like they purely go out there and catch fish and that's how they make a living. So much of it is branding and creating your own business entity. And then you realize like when you go out there, it's not just about trying to win the tournament because you can have a bad tournament, but if you have good content that kind of supplements it for whether it's sponsors or, or what have you. And I know like the, the old guard doesn't like that, but it's like, it's 2023 guys. Mm -hmm. This is the way it is for better or worse. Yeah. It's um, all about content. It's all about content, but it's also about bringing some kind of value. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I, I've starting to get this stuff and, and probably there, there's people that are better content creators than I am. I don't even consider myself one yet, um, but it's not just you're not just dumping stuff on the Internet like it's that's not how it is at all. And if you put value into it, it it's really the difference in somebody's career. Uh, look at what Matt's done on his channel. Like it just goes to show you it's just a long game. It's not like you upload one video video and you're Mr. Beast at all mm -hmm. a lot of work goes into it but anyway since this is not like a youtube tutorial though it could be i guess um let's see let's see if we close that out right there yeah because i want to get out it's just so freaking cold right now i wanted to actually go out and shoot a video this weekend coming up but i got stuff with the wife i have to do oh well you got to keep them happy mm. i don't have to you know it's not a bad thing <laughs> 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 it is a good thing in my in my department. That's why I'm fishing three of the next four days. <laughs> uh, are you fishing the warm side or the cold side of Lake Anna? Cold side. Cold side. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you, I didn't know if you're fishing the warm side. I, I love the warm I side. Dude, warm side is legit. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. I like going there I a lot. That, I think that sucks the most about that is they need to open that up because I would definitely pay an annual fee or whatever to be able to get in there. Yeah. But. Just got to know somebody. Luckily, I do. Yeah, like, and I, I get that, but it's like they could make a shit ton of money if they started mm -hmm. charging people to like, because I know there's a ton that would pay mm -hmm. any price to be able to get in there on on a monthly. I don't know, but anyway, especially in the winter time, the summertime, meh. It's just no, nah. but in the in the winter, it's it's fun to go catch fish and on top water when it's thirty degrees outside. That, that is a lot of fun. And speaking of winter, um, you know, I did want to talk to you about a little bit about winter fishing, but first, uh, you ended up 
almost cashing a major check with the state record. Uh, I I want the back history of how this happened, and I'm going to try to scour <laughs> the internet to pull up a picture. I don't know if I have a picture of this thing. I think I sent it to you on Instagram. I don't know if you can pull it up, but I can pull that up. I mean, it's honestly nothing crazy. It, it was crazy just the fact that I made one cast and I caught it, and I the person I think, the person I was with really makes the story awesome because it's kind of the person who like got me passionate about crappie fishing on the reservoir. And really he loves to crappie fish. His name's Juan Duran. And he loves to crappie fish. And he and I don't get to fish as much as I'd like, but when we when we do go fishing, we try and crappie fish because he loves it so much. And I have the live scope and he hasn't really crappie fished out there with it that that often. And it is such a good place to crappie fish. Like there's there's so many swimming around in that place that are that same size. It's crazy. But um, yeah, it's just, we were bass fishing. We caught a couple of nice fish and we go up to this uh, one section of the lake. That's really good for crappie and bass. And there was uh, a big row of stumps kind of on a, on a, on a point. And I just, I picked up, I was crappie fishing. Like it was literally, I picked up my crappie rod, get a, I have a custom crappie jigs are innovative jigs the guy used to live on the reservoir he moved to florida and makes these crappie jigs are really good but um threw that over there and just watched it go down to the stump and i just saw a blob just come off of the stump and it's the way you crappie fish you cast it out and you like pendulum it back so you're not like just letting it straight fall down because the crappie 99 percent of the time you'll eat them you'll, or they'll eat it when it's falling if there's a bunch of them i've noticed but if it's just like one or two crappie they won't eat it unless it's above their head so it's like you kind of like watch it and you just kind of i don't even like to move it that much i just like to pendulum it back to the boat i just kind of lift it up and just kind of reel it and i just saw the fish come off the stump and i just kept my crappie jig up and it just goes thunk and I set the hook and I'm using four pound line on like a zero power Dobbins rod. So it's oh, just, it, it, I set the hook and it just goes, zzz, 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 and it just takes off. And my buddy was like, Oh, you got a bass. I was like, I don't think this is a bass dude. And it <laughs> it comes up next to the boat. And I mean, it's just, we, he started freaking out. Cause I mean, that's, I'm, I, I'm not a crappie fisherman, so I'm not going to call it fish of a lifetime, but that was, that was pretty close. It, it was a fish of a lifetime. <laughs> it was a state record. <laughs> it was, it was, <laughs> it was big dude. Like the first time we saw it, we both freaked out. It dove, dove down under the boat and then it came back up. And when he put it in the net, I mean, it just filled the whole bottom of the net. It was crazy, man. That's a, that was a dinner plate. That's freaking dude. And guys, I, uh, I checked the messenger. It is not there, Here, but well, uh, when Matt said, yeah, when Matt sends me in the picture, I'll either put it in post or, or whatever. That's what I like about doing these pre-recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, dude, the thing is freaking, it's massive. And then the whole thing about you, you had to call your friend and Odenkirk getting Odenkirk involved. That's that's awesome. It was I honestly wish I'd hadn't called him because then I wouldn't have confirmed that I had the state record because he was just kind of like, yeah, you had it. <laughs> but now it's <laughs> back in the lake. It's <laughs> like. I was like, yeah, that's true, I guess. But I didn't even think about it until after the fact. Like I told you, I was driving home and I was like, I wonder what the state record is. Guys, that thing is so freaking big. God damn. I'll send you the picture yeah, it, of the scale so people don't people can believe guys believe that. It, it looks like it's photoshopped. You know what? You bring up an interesting point about that. We'll get into that too. Got some good drama on that. I promise it's not photoshopped. <laughs> Oh, it's so and I beautiful. promise there's bigger ones there. Is that a, that's a white, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Supposedly. Now, people, I'm sure, will comment on this and be like, that's not a white crappie. It's a black crappie. But John Odenkirk confirmed it because I sent him the picture and he saw it. So the top weight is the is the weight of the fish. 361 was the, the previous largemouth I locked in the scale. 3.46 pounds. Jesus. God, that is a big ass crappie. It oh was my God. it was pretty big. Do you think there's a four pounder swimming in there? Yes. No question. Oh. I did not catch the biggest one by by a long shot. You see, and this is where I think it's fun. So there was a um there was allegedly a 10 pounder caught out of Riverton. Um I believe but that. but the individual didn't weigh it and show the weight. And so this is interesting here where I think like this day, whether you want to give up your spots or not. 
always have a GoPro running so you have video because people can't then BS that it's photoshopped. Okay, you can figure that out. But then also keep a scale in your boat. Always. Like I don't understand keep this. Two. Like, yeah. Like <laughs> I, I, again, because if no one's gonna believe you nowadays mm -hmm. because of all the technology, you caught it or not. Like whether it's a ten pound bass or a big ass crappy like this, it was just awesome that you had a scale in the boat to be able to get this information. I'm, th I'm I remember the picture you're talking about. If it was the same one. I wasn't sure if that was on Riverton or not. It looked kind of looked like it, but yeah, and it, it's a solid fish. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's ten pounds. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say it's... it was or it wasn't. I'm not going to cause drama, but it was I mean, big and it was giant for the Shenandoah River. But I don't know if it was ten pounds. So I think it's about six to seven, honestly, because I think it's the eye popping. Honestly, ten. It's so weird. Like a ten pound bass. I think nine to eleven pounds are pretty close, mm -hmm. but when they're under that nine pound category, they just look like a different fish. Mm -hmm. It's so it's, weird. They how look that is. totally different. They do, like if you're holding a nine pounder, they like dwarf your body. Yes. It's just yes. Like, it's very noticeable in the picture. Like it's just like that looks that looks photoshopped. Like a ten pounder. It's just, the one he caught on the reservoir. I don't know if I'll send you that picture too, so you can pop pop that one up. Me, oh, he's probably got it. I got it on my phone. Let me pull this one up too, guys. But this one here, I think, was about nine ish. He said um, seven eighty was that one was seven eighty. Mm -hmm. He's a he's a smaller guy. <laughs> Don't let him hear that. But like, still, like that one, like there, like you could probably have lied about it and said it was about eight to nine. Mm -hmm. and I probably would believe you. But yeah, I don't know. It's just so crazy. Like how they get that next class of fish too. Because yeah, you're right. Seven and up, seven to eleven pounds. They all look thick they're just different did you send me that other photo i'm, I'm about that, to i'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking okay. for it right now it's way back in the camera roll now were you his partner for that day uh which day the 10 pounder no uh -uh. yeah but i'll tell you a funny story that day so we're coming out of uh who's run which is one of the places on the reservoir and they're fishing down lake across the lake and we passed them and alex had just caught his pb he, it was like a 790 or something. And we come out of the lake and I was, we were like, Alex just caught an eight pounder and just yelled it across the lake to him. And they both were like, holy shit. And then they catch like a six and a half, like right after that happened. If you watch this video, like you can see what I'm talking about. Like you see us run by and yell it. And then he makes a cast and catches like a six and a half. And like 30 minutes later, he texts us and Ace, Ace goes, Matt just caught a 10 pounder. I was like, no way. Oh, that's freaking awesome it was it was nuts yeah so that's that's the 10 pounder like it just it, it looks it looks unreal like you said the eyeballs there's a dude there's something about those eyeballs when they get to that size like they're not they're not supposed to be all right let's get this up for you guys here good god Jesus, that thing is huge. It's lake record. I bet there's a 12 pounder in that lake. I just, I bet. That's I lake. never believed there was a 10 pounder, to be honest. I just think there's so many good fishermen that have been fishing that place for so long and nobody's ever legitimately caught one. And then that fish popped up and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, there's definitely 10 pounders in here. <laughs> So, so I like I, I like religiously listen to like Matt Allen and stuff, especially his older swim bait stuff. And it's crazy what he would say. It's like those fish, when they get that big, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. And he said the, the the state record fish always come out of the most highly pressured places. He said always. And he said like the places I was catching 15 pounders out in California, they weren't big lakes and they get pounded. And that's the thing is those fish get educated and then they get big because they don't get caught a lot. Mm. And it's just with that said. I again, I really think there's a 12 pounder probably swimming around there, it, it, whether it's going to be that one in a couple of years or what, because the bait's there. The food is there to get them that big. I mean, there's five pound crappie in there too, probably. <laughs> and that's why I think white works so well. I really don't think people understand that white is can be a shad, but it can also be crappie in the mm -hmm. springtime that gets stacked up. That's like Al, Alex and I were talking about this today. It's like 90% of the fish, if not more, that we caught this year, minus bed fishing, were power fishing. Really? Yes. Like shad now, style baits, like crank baits, spoons, jerk baits. Because you fear a spinning rod or just no, I love a spin, I love a spinning rod, dude. Oh, really? I love, we, we we catch fish on drop shots all the time. Shit. Okay, never but mind. I, Take that back. I love I love fishing a spinning rod. I think it's awesome. Um two of my nicest rods are actually spinning rods, but uh, um yeah, it's just I just it's a place like that you need to get them to react. 
and I'm not get, really getting them to react too much with the spinning rod. You know, it's like I'm throwing big baits past them and just burning stuff past their face or ripping a spoon, dredging a crankbait, like pulling it, like moving the rod as fast as I can across my body because I can't reel fast enough kind of thing. So it's just like, but yeah, it's just all reaction baits for the most part that we caught fish on this year. How, how is that even possible with how pressured that place gets? By really good anglers that know that lake. How, what, what, what do you mean? Like, how's what? Like, you guys are able to power fish like you did, and mm-hmm. you, you rake the field with what you did. But that tournament series is based on guys that only fish that place habitually. And yet, it's still a power fisherman's paradise, which is insane. Because you would think that place would get more like a finesse approach would start setting in because mm-hmm. of pressure. But yet, you're able to get out there and still fish that way, which is impressive. I just think there's fish that just don't get touched. There's spots. Really? A lot of these spots are still community holes. Like people who have been fishing the lake 30 years know of the spots that we're fishing. Like it's not a big secret. Like you, the lake's small. People are going to drive by and see you or they're mm-hmm. going to side scan it and find it. Like there's decent mapping on the lake. There's nothing like crazy, like really accurate contour lines, but you can find the stuff. I just, I just think there's so many fish in the lake. Like it is just and they grow that, fast so they're just that's interesting i i, I don't i don't know why i mean and there are guys one of our good friends rob it's all he, he just throws a drop shot most of the time and he crushes them the drop shot's awesome out there especially hmm. in the early summer it kind of weans off because i feel like instead of from year to year the fish get educated out there it's more like they get educated throughout the season it's like they'll get off of something throughout the season because they they've they've seen it for a month and a half two months like everybody's throwing a drop shot on a point or a football jig or something and then you wait a year and june rolls around and it's like they haven't seen it before i just find this stuff fascinating um and maybe it's because of all the conversations i've had this past year but it's the fact that you have a place that's under two thousand acres roughly and it is able to produce like it does with the pressure that it has and that there's really no secrets because you can see the whole lake fairly easy if you spend like a summer doing it and it can still do it so like what is the definition of pressure and and like do we do we as anglers create so much drama like example like i know guys with my show like look at the comment sections and all the all the shit that's been going on but it's the fact that people are complaining about pressure on like the tidal potomac or something like that but yet if you take it in microcosm you know, the res can still pump them out. And so maybe the problem is not that this places are getting that much pressure. It's the fact that we're not adapting quick enough. And I think what you're saying to the bait thing is a hundred percent what it is. The professional angler, what they can do like a Brandon Polinick and in, is in 20 minutes, they can break down what they need to make the adjustments on to get them to bite versus a lot of weekend warriors that I know personally, that will just lock in doing the exact same thing for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. They're not willing to change. And then what they do is they complain that there's fishing pressure. It's this or it's that. It's like, no, it's like, you're just not adapting quick enough to, to stay ahead of the curb. And I, I, I wouldn't say you have to adapt because of pressure so much as forage. Like it's mm, turned yeah. into a, the bait has just gone crazy out there. And one of, one of my good buddies I talked to tonight, he's probably the best Carolina rig fisherman out there. And he would crush them all summer in the last two or three seasons. He struggled. And I think it's because of the bait. It's like the fish are feeding up. They're not eating bottom baits as much. Like even, like I said, I was power fishing. We caught some really nice fish on a football jig this year, but I'm using a three quarter ounce and I'm ripping it off the bottom and they're eating it on the way down. So it's like, I'm not really catching them, just dragging a bait. Like I'm getting them to react to something popping off the bottom, but, and three, but three or four years ago, he did really well. And I think that might've had something to do with the fact we had a shad kill which I think might be about to happen out there again, because we're going to get this warm week next week. And if it stays warm for like two or three weeks, and then it just goes boop and just gets cold. Like it was the last week, it's going to kill a shad. And then the fit, there won't be as many bait fish in the lake for the year. And then they'll probably change and they'll go fish and start eating on the bottom better. Yeah. Do you think it's, I, I, I like that, but I was thinking, well, what about the crayfish population? Billy Coles, who's the guy down at Smith mountain Lake. I mean, he blew my mind with said like he only fishes a jig around a full moon because mm-hmm. he thinks that's when the crayfish bite's going to be at its peak. And that really got me thinking, it's like, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder when fish go off of that bottom bite, is it because there's, like you said, it's different forage. The crayfish mm-hmm. just aren't the thing anymore. Oh, they they'll, there's, I think there's plenty of big crayfish in the lake. I think because like you said, that full moon in June, 
they just oh yeah they bl- bl- light it up it's really good but <laughs> um i mean yeah i just but it, we talked about this earlier how it's like the fish know mm-hmm. they know when something's about to happen and they'll they'll start chewing that they'll they'll go on like the shad spawn like I don't think that's just fish roaming around and they're like, oh, there's a shad spawning on this wall. Let me go eat them. It's like I feel like something triggers in their in their brain, like in an area of a lake. They're like they're, the shad are spawning right now because they know what time of year it is. And then they just congregate over to the bluff wall or the grass, the the flat that's the shad are spawning on or wherever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's forage based a lot of the times. They're opportunistic feeders mm-hmm. and we don't give them that credit. And I, and I think honestly, like that's, what's going to make you a better angler is, is taking advantage of the different feed windows that there are, whether it's like when they stock trout in local ponds, I know of, or it's the shad spawn, or it's when the crappie start bunching up in the springtime, you know, in key areas, which also coincidentally happens usually when the bass are in pre-spawn mode. So they have major feed windows guys. And this is something you need to know about. Cause like the crappie will usually spawn before the large mouth. So that's how they can also get their feet on. And then in the post spawn, they have the shad spawn to deal with so they can recuperate after um, they do their spawn deal. So there's always a major feed window available. You just got to be able to tune it in on, you know, whatever body of water that you're fishing. I mean, but you know, that's, that's that lesson for today. Mm-hmm. But the, what, what is something though, that you think you want to improve on though, this coming year? And is it just lake wise or body of water wise? Cause you said like the Potomac river, you want to get a little bit more. Uh, Potomac. Definitely. Personal. I definitely want to dial in the Potomac. I need to, I want to find some more areas. I want to just figure out like Belmont Bay, for example, like I want to figure out how to get a better quality bite in Belmont Bay than everybody else. Like I want to figure out cause people are winning tournaments at Belmont Bay around 40 or 50 boats in the spring. Like it's just, there's that one guy who's got something a little different and I just want to, I just want to dial in those few things. I want to find some areas where the grass is better. Like I just, I just want to spend more time out there and just, just dial in areas, baits, figure a few things out. And I figured one thing out already though. And it took me four months to figure this out. My partner was whooping me with a swim jig, same swim jig all year, same exact one, same weight, same trailer, and he was just getting so many more bites. And I was like, what is going on? And he was throwing 15 pound line and I was throwing 17. If you want to dominate on the upper, the Potomac river, you got to mimic those Japanese anglers period. Yeah. It's like, it's the pressure stuff. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I have a video about that. So people can get mad at me coming up this spring where I kind of get into that, but it's because it's all public. It's all public areas that, you know, if you want to win a multi-day tournament, um, I think you can win like a Tuesday night or out of like a secret spot, but mm-hmm. to win multi-day events, it's about, you got to think about how the pressure does it. And there's a reason why there's a Japanese guy that won on the James. Like I will, I'll get into that guys on another stream too, but yeah. I, and I'll, I'll talk to you about it a little bit after we get off here. <laughs> Cause yeah, it, you don't have to overthink the spots. It's just got, you got to get nerdy with the tackle mm-hmm. and, and you can kick ass on it. It's that simple. Yeah. But definitely, definitely the river. Um, I'd like to expand the the res knowledge because I talked about this on the last podcast. It's like the res kind of like it matches so many different places because it's like it, it fishes like a lowland reservoir. It fishes like a highland reservoir. It's like I want to take some things that I've learned on the res and take the time, which I haven't really had the time to go travel and try these things that I've learned. Just Just these little random dumb baits that they chew on the res and just try them somewhere else and see if I can kind of match up, which I've been able to do on certain places like Anna. Anna seems somewhat similar to the res. It's not as, it's not as clear as um, Anna is, but it seems the forage is similar. I know they have herring in, in Anna, yes. but it's it, everybody I've talked to says they don't act like a herring, like, like Murray or one of those places where they just come up school and like crazy or anything. Like I've talked to a few it, people about it and they just say it's not the same. It's not, it's not full on, you know, Carolina lakes. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if it ever will. I, I, and I think maybe it'll go in cycles. I think if we have a bad shad kill, then the blueback might become the majority. Uh, the nice thing is though, there are some points on there that when the shad are spawning, you you can get fat in Mm -hmm. a hurry. But again, there's not as many. I think that's the issue. Like I've, I've personally been down to Murray, Kiwi and Hartwell, and there's a 
F ton of points. <laughs> There's not a lot of points in Lake Anna, mm-hmm. like just comparison wise. So I, I don't think that's a good pattern because again, like you just can't run it without running into another boat. Uh, what was the other like? Not Kerr. Damn it. I know that like Gadsden. That's a place that mm-hmm. has a good blueback population and that's growing and they have spots too. So that's probably going to become like more of like a Lake Hartwell here shortly. Mm-hmm. The think. spots are a problem there too, aren't they? It's, they want you to yeah. take them out. And I, I don't know the ruling on that. Like, is it you have to kill them or is it like the snakehead where you can still let them go? I think it's like the snakehead, but they want you to take them when you catch okay. them. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah, that's another place I want to fish again. That I haven't fished in a long time. Last time I fished that, there was tons of grass in it before they killed it mm-hmm. all. So that shows you last time. I, I don't think I've, there. I've been to Gaston one time and I fished it from the bank. <laughs> Really? Mm-hmm. Gaston is great. And so is Roanoke Rapids. That place is fun too. I hear Roanoke Rapids is awesome. Very yeah, good. If you look at like the, the the Jumbo Elite uh Jumbo Club, they went there in like their first or second tournament last year and they demolished them. It took like forty five pounds over two days. Dude, why don't you fish a tournament series like that? It's far. It takes and it's a two day event and you have to fish by yourself. Oh, gotcha. So that's not a team oriented thing, which is, which is cool. I got some, I got some buddies who fish it. Uh, a guy named Tev, he fishes, it, he does really well. Um, I, I want to, if I, the, I think the first one's on Chick Lake, so I might run down there and fish that one, but two, two day event and John boat all by yourself is and driving four and a half hours. Now, are, are you, and I don't know if we mentioned this off air or on air, whatever, um, for the Potomac series, are you fishing out of your, res outfit or are you fishing out of a friend's i got a buddy he's got a ranger okay that's way safer no (laughs) i'd be going in the absco every tournament just hoping that the wind didn't blow around that point (laughs) yeah that's why i'm not fishing um the kayak series i'm part of they go to the top potomac and i told them i'm not fishing that thing like i just if it's open launch it's cool because then you can go into matter woman you can go down to aquia you can launch an aquaquan and that, that's cool but if it's a if it's a centered launch and you got to launch at a certain place i would never do it in a kayak i just wouldn't i just if i have to fish the potomac in the spring i'm gonna hop in a, a fiberglass boat tournament type of deal like that like i just have more fun with it like mm-hmm. i mean like the kayak is meant for the rivers like i mean i, I know the tournament that you should have won allegedly mm-hmm. but uh the, like that that's where kayaks dominate that's where it's a lot of fun is when you get into these places mm-hmm. and apparently MVTBL is letting us do Sleeters Lake this year and Beaver Dam, apparently. And so if that's the case, that's going to be fun because that's going to be a W if I can get into Sleeters somehow. I got to see what the uh, the park regs are that. I'll but, fish that yeah. one. Dude, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Beaver Dam for sure I would jump in because that's five minutes from my house. Oh, really? I'm in Ashburn, so. Dude, Beaver Dam, I have not fished that since I was like a kid. Dude. I, like, is that, how's that place been it's since ama- like they got it? That's amazing. Awesome. The first, the first day that I heard somebody went out there, a buddy of mine went out there in his kayak. This is like the first fishing trip day that I heard of when they reopened it. And he had a 42 pound bag and he had a nine pounder in like 45 minutes mm. off of one spot. I've caught, I think we've caught 20, a 26 pound bag out of Sleaters. I think that was the biggest, but that, that was way back in the day before it had access like that and goose dude, I'm telling you like, that's going to be fun when that tournament comes. Um, like the, again, those are places just, just hidden gems that no one even thinks about. Cause I think it's just, you get so urbanized that you completely like, and Berkeley, like, we've talked about Berkeley like, before we started here, Berkeley, like, if you know what you're doing, man, that can still pump out good bags mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Berkeley like, is awesome. It's full of fish. Do you think people just forget about that exists because it's so small comparatively to like all the other places around here? I don't know. I mean, I've I've been out there a few times where there's been b- boats, but I've never been out there where I've felt like I'm not going to fish any spot that I'm because it falls into the live scope thing. And a lot of people, when I do go out there, there's not very many people fishing the brush piles and the points. And a lot of people are burning the banks. A lot of people are snakehead fishing because it is the best like to go snakehead fishing. In, in northern virginia really it is crazy. if you go throw a frog in the grass you're gonna catch a 10 oh my god it's crazy dude like uh, if you could if you could if you could bow fish there that place would be it would be hot for a week i am adding that to my to-do list yeah if you want to catch a snakehead mm-hmm. go to burke lake sweet adding that there done live scope um so no, kumar no. No, yeah. don't, don't do it. 
Kumar uh, had this article that dumped, and then I bitched about it on my live stream on Sun or Saturday, whatever it was, Christmas Eve. That guys just got uploaded to today. He was talking about how anglers are now starting to see like, is live scope going to go the way of the umbrella rig, where the pressure is setting in? And then I've I've talked to you, and I've talked to like Billy Coles, who 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 swears by live scope, and he's even saying like, yeah, they're starting to shy away from it when you get on top of them. Now that more and more people have it, like. I think there's a great chance where it, ah, fish are going to get lockjawed to the point that maybe it's not going to be as easy as before, but I don't know necessarily like to what degree live scope won't work. I think those things. Uh, yeah. I, th I think those single fish that you just see 30 feet away from your boat, you're not going to be able to catch that fish. Like the percentage is going to go down. You'll still be able to catch that fish, but it's not going to be as easy as it was. Like I was, I can't remember who, I think it was Milliken or somebody. Somebody Milliken is by far the best live scope fisherman on YouTube or that I've yeah. ever seen. I mean, it's ridiculous. He's got it so dialed, but um, he's also fishing in a place that it's meant for to catch ten pounders. But um, yeah, I just I can't remember who showed it, but it's like if you see a fish at eighty to ninety feet out and you make the cast, you're going to catch that fish like seventy five percent of the time. I can't remember who posted this like these percentages or whatnot, but it goes down as you get closer. So it's like 50 feet. You're going to have like a 30 to 40% chance of catching that fish. And if he's 10 to 20 feet away, you got like a five to 10% chance of catching that fish. So I think that those percentages will go down because people are starting to see him, but I just, or the, the fish are starting to know. I, and I don't know if it's because they're feeling the beam, if they're feeling the transducer on them. I, I, I mean, they have to hear it. If you have live scope, it clicks it's just like a normal transducer. Like you can, when it, when it's on, you can hear it clicking. So I don't know if that's, that's, what's going to affect them. And that's where like a hydro wave might come in where you can kind of counter like offset the transducer messing with them. You can put the hydro wave on and kind of get rid of that. I'm sure a bunch of pros do that and don't talk about it, but um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna start affecting the fishing because I don't think the fish are like, yeah, how, like how the hell is he casting at me? I'm in, out in the middle of nowhere kind of thing, but it's just going to be like, they're just, I mean, it's a presence thing, right? It's like deer hunting or any kind of hunting. It, it's like they, I think the fish are associating, like they feel something different and then they understand that they're getting caught when they feel that thing. Mm -hmm. And so what is that thing? And I think, I don't know if it's clicking, but that would make sense if it's closer. Maybe I think the problem is it's the beam strength. I think the, the higher the quality and guys, I'm not a physicist. I'm talking out my mm -hmm. ass here, but if you have to run, you know, three lithium batteries to get enough juice to have the the newest live scope version to have that cleaner image, is that putting out more energy into the water so they can feel it with their lateral line? Like uh, again, like I know they just came out Garmin. I think this is the the one I got, which can see up to like two hundred feet or whatever. But then again, am I giving the fish cancer when I turn that thing on? And from two hundred feet away, they can feel it, and then it's going to shut them down. Like I, I think it's also in Travis Luger. Um, I just had him on the show and he talked about it. like, he's getting live scope for his book. Cause he fished the bass open. He said like, yeah, there's some situations you need it, but on the same token, he's like, I don't know how the hell these fish are not like lockjaw when you see 20 people out in no man's land, looking at, looking at their bow, of their boat at some point, they got to shut off to it. And I, I don't know. I, I really don't like, I know guys, I made the vestment again. I'm running it in my kayak this year too. But then do I think it's going to be something where you can go out there and just smoke them 24 seven with your graph on? I don't know if it's going to be like that anymore, especially since all the brands have it now. I just, I just disagree. Honestly, I think it's just going to stay really? the same because if really? you think about how dumb a Potomac river bass is <laughs> there, every single bass that lives on the Potomac river, that's over three pounds has been on, been caught on a jackhammer chatterbait six times. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, they're just going to keep eating it. Yeah, but uh, the swim jig is now becoming more of a thing. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, like, that, absolutely. Mean so. But that's one thing. I'm like, they've all been caught on a yeah. Cinco or a swim jig or a chatterbait. That's the same, same kind of deal. I just, you're just gonna have to get smarter on how to catch them because the. I think it's it's more. It, it might be more of a bait conditioning thing. It's like they're gonna see an a rig way more. They're gonna see a jerk bait way more. It's just like I'll give a little nugget for the fountainhead thing. I figured out an eight inch Nico worm like just taking a magnum trick worm basically and nico rigging it with like a one-aught nico hook like a big hook with and putting it on a bait caster and i would throw Dude, it you're gonna get some death threats for saying i that. mean oh I, I figured it out so you know what they, if you can go out in the res and figure figure out how to catch them doing this 
more power to you, but I would take it and I'd throw it like 10 feet past the brush pile and I would burn an eight inch worm over the top of the brush pile and they'd come unglued for it. So it's like just just, stupid yeah. things like that. Like you're just going to have to figure out how to throw something dumb on live scope that you wouldn't think would catch a bass and you catch, you can catch them with it. Like you're just going to have to change up what you're doing. I think. No. And I, that's a hundred percent. I think that's what really hurts a lot of anglers when they get into like secret spot stuff is it's not about the spot. It's about your technique and your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I blew a guy's mind. I think it was Shane Flynn outdoors when he was sniping bass on Huntington run. And I pulled up with a spy bait and started just smoking them. And he's like, where'd you learn that? It's like, dude, it's just like when they get pressured, you got to start thinking finesse mm -hmm. stuff and have that in your back pocket. And you can throw stuff like that in weird situations and it might be weird for you, but just think like he hasn't, that fish hasn't seen that look before mm -hmm. and you're giving him that different look. And if your mindset's like that about always thinking like, how do I show this differently? That's when you're going to get a couple more bites. Mm -hmm. That's where the glide bait comes in. Mm -hmm. That mentality. It's just, I've, I've thrown normal baits at fish on live scopes so many times and they just kind of like, they'll, 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 they'll look at it. Like their instinct is like, they're just intrigued by it. Like they're op opportunistic. Like you said, like they'll come out of the tree or they'll come off the, off the bottom and be like, Oh, what's that? But then you throw an eight inch glide bait over them and they're like, Holy shit. And they come flying up to it. It's just like, yeah. cause nobody's throwing that. No, there's, no one's throwing that. No, there's just not a lot of people out there throwing big glide baits. What what's that like? Do you, you don't have to give up the shoes you don't want mm -hmm. to. What brand or what style glides do you like? Um, S Waver, the two hundred's good. Um, Phony Frog was really good, and then I had like a fifty pound catfish eat it and break me off. Um, there goes there went a, a good chunk of change. Um, if I can shout one out, it's Fish Everything. Go for it. Um, that the Fish Everything glide bait, the one that Victor makes is awesome. It's bad. Uh, guys, I'll put that in the episode description. Um what you said uh fish everything victor, victor depe fish sorry everything. if i botched your name victor victor i'll make sure i get this right before this episode goes live uh so we can get that that dialed in yeah it's fish no. fish everything is the name of the bait company and they're hard to get like it's like i was texting him the other day he sold a couple of baits to jordan lee like the it, it's the real deal they, the, he there's just something about how he makes them they just glide so well he just came out with a 10 inch like that will never get pressured. I, no. I put my soul on it. I just, I've had this conversation before. I think it was with a friend. Um, and he was asked like, what do you, what do you think? Well, Cause I always thought like the chatterbait's the next thing. It's going to get, it's going to become so bad that you could just deviate to like a lipless bait or a swim jig and you'll outfish people. Cause everyone's throwing it. I don't think it's ever going to be to a point where the top 10 are throwing a mag draft, a nine inch mag draft, because the mental thing is you are very much limiting yourself to what you're going to hook that day. And I don't think people have the, I don't know, the guts, the balls to just say like, yeah, I'm going to look for just five bites today. Cause like, that's what you're doing with those type of baits. I think it's the people who can bridge the gap that will do better. It's like where, you know, yeah. if I pick this up for a certain percentage of the day and I can get two bites on it, I know I'm going to have 20 pounds because I'm going to catch my limit doing traditional stuff. I'm going to catch a couple of decent fish. If I catch a big one, great. But if I put this in my hand in the right situations, based on conditions, obviously, and where you're throwing it, and like I said before, time on the water, it's like, you know, there's certain places where these fish react to big baits. Now, it's where the mm -hmm. bigger fish live, too, obviously. But it, there's certain, there, for me on the res, it's there's certain places where that just, there's certain brush piles or certain just lay downs or something where I know if I throw a mag draft or a glide bait over top of it, like something's going to come out and it's probably going to be big, but now do you throw any, like, do you ever get into the, like the gizzard shad lookalikes or the bottom bumping big baits or is everything you're doing in the upper end of the water no, column? Upper, upper end of the water column. Okay. Yeah. We need to have a whole show on that. I need to get like you and a couple other guys just to talk swim baits. Cause that's a fun, I, I'm not even like I'm super addicted well versed in it. I just love throwing it. Cause I know. And I, I, I think I caught a couple of fish that we weighed in in the fountainhead tournaments on the eight inch mag draft, but nothing on a glide bait, but I caught a lot of big ones on a glide bait, just like out fun fishing. <laughs> and it was just like a conditions thing. It's like, I would go out and practice on like a Wednesday and have catch two five pounders on the glide bait, text Alex and be like, I'm throwing this all day. And he gets so mad at me. <laughs> He'd be like, I'm going to cut it off. You're not doing it. But, and then I, I would throw it for an hour during the tournament and they would follow it, but they wouldn't just, they just wouldn't touch it. It has to be just so right for that glide bait bite. Yeah. Um, Versus like a, I don't know, like a bottom bumping Huddleston kind of thing, which is my favorite way of fishing a swim bait. Cause that's just, 
man, when that line goes slack, you know, whatever it is going to be a freaking mouth. Just monster. I've never caught a fish on a Huddleston. <laughs> oh my God. That's it's a fun oh, bite. I bet it's it's awesome. a fun bite. I caught one that way. I caught a nine pounder on a Matt lures bluegill, uh, a bluegill, bait. I think it was Sleater's Lake. And then I caught one on an American trash fish. That was seven ish. But again, it's, it, it sucks because you are, you are, it's literally like you are just slowly just dragging the bottom. But what's so much fun is like when they hit it, it's just, you go slack and it's in their gut. Yeah. Um, but you're not getting bit a lot, but when you do, it's usually a good one. I've caught some fish and on that's, trash fish. You trash mm-hmm. fish. Yeah. Those, those are really, but the, I can't find a company like they're always in back order, but I cannot find a company that has the same softness of plastic and it has all the appendages like the trash fish. And I, I like mega bass, but mega bass's plastic is still too hard mm-hmm. compared to the trash yep. fish. The mag slow, I think that's how you say it, the slow. I thought it was a mag slow, but it's got an L at the end because <laughs> of mega bass. Um, that one's a lot softer than the mag draft, but it looks exact same. Okay, it's just, I've, I haven't had much luck on it. I don't know why. The mag draft is just like when you find that sweet spot when you're reeling, it's just, it's so nice. You can feel oh, that it. thing is. It's it, it's it's caught a lot of a lot of I I've caught some pretty big fish on it. I caught my PB on it, my previous PB. Do you ever do you ever change like the hooks out on that thing, or do you just fish it standard? standard. Really, the eight inch, wow. the six inch, I can change the hooks out, but the eight inch, the hook's so big, it's just like it's sharp. You set the hook, you get a hook in them, reel as fast as you can, and just dump them in the bottom of the boat. Do you ever worry about gut hooking those bigger fish with that bait, with that big treble hook? If you go back to the tournament standings, there's one little that you can see that they're all highlighted mm. in like different colors. There's one that it's just like we won two, and then there's just like a 15 pound one. I killed like a four and a half pounder on the eight inch mag draft because I hooked them in the tongue. Yeah, that's that's my worry with those big baits. Cost us some money. But yeah, but I mean, like it happens. I mean, yeah, the mag draft is a. When we were throwing the six inch before I really started like throwing the eight inch, when we were throwing the six inch, it was like, you'd hook one and it would be grab the Mountain Dew or the catch and release as soon as you hook them. Cause the hook is in their tongue. It's just, how did you, how did you get the confidence to go from six to eight? Cause a lot of people, man, they can't handle that. Just live, live scope, <laughs> honestly, just seeing how many more fish will come out and look at it. And, and, and honestly it, it's intimidating, but it's easier to throw in my opinion. Cause you can feel it. The six inch is like, you can't really feel the tail thumping. You don't know when you're at that, that perfect speed. You kind of have to just like figure that out throughout the cast and like how, how you're fishing it. But the eight inch is like, you know, when it's the perfect speed, like your rod tip is like perfectly, like just a little bent. You can feel the tail thumping. Like, you know, you're right in the, right in the zone. And, but you have to have a special rod for it. Like you can't just throw, you can't throw the eight inch on like a seven, six flipping stick. No. And again, like guys, if you want to get into the big, the big fish stuff, I would say go check out Matt Allen and, and uh, milk and fish milking fishing. I can never get his name right. Both of Mil- them are really good with the swim base. Milliken. What? Milliken. What the fuck? Yeah. Uh, but, but Milliken fishing, Matt Allen from tactical bassing, both those guys, I think are like the one, two punch of swim bait stuff. Cause you want to max out your gear. Cause you will hook something massive and you want to be able to just get them in the boat period. Around here, 20 pound line is good. Really? You go 20 pounds. I, I throw the eight inch on 20. I don't go any bigger. See, maybe that's because I use 80 pound braid to a liter. Mm. That way it, whatever I hook, I can just boat flip or just winch it. 20 pound fluorocarbon, baby. <sighs> you're not afraid at all. Damn. Not when you're using CUR. Yeah. You just got bigger balls on that. There's just, no way. I'm... I like the stretch. So my opinion with the whole <sighs> braid to fluorocarbon is it's yeah. one more thing that can break. It's like it's one more thing that you can mess up, and I get it when you beef it up to eighty, like you you said. And what 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 pound leader do you throw? I use twenty five pound. Uh, it's the Sunline. It's a Sunline leader material, mm-hmm. so it has shock absorbing quality to it. Yeah, I mean that's just I, it's just one more thing that's just kind of like just sphincter kind of goes up when they bite it. <laughs> just like, yeah, no, it just it freaks me out, and I I like the stretch. Cause I feel like you lose a lot like the a rig. I will never throw an a rig on, on braid. Hmm. I won't do it. I just, and the Dobbins just came out with a new a rig rod. It's basically a crankbait rod. Like it's just, it loads all the way up to the butt, like right up to the handle. Like I just, I like the stretch. I just feel, I feel like you lose them less. Cause you see that, that makes sense for 
an a rig rod mm-hmm. which is basically you're just it's a glorified monster spinner bait honestly mm-hmm. and you want the pulsing if you're trying to do a swim bait on the bottom a bottom contact spinner it's almost like a swim jig where when you're crawling that thing you want to feel every pebble because when that fish takes in that bait he's going to nose it and he's going to suck it in and spit it out so quick mm-hmm. you need to feel everything to hit it and that's why i have to have braid on mine just to make sure i'm not going to miss a bite with that but to your point, that might be my issue is I just use my mag draft rod with my bottom bumping Huddleston rod and I switch them out. And maybe that's something I need to, to just create a designated mag draft rod. Interesting. Yeah, it's just, hmm. I, 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 it's kind yeah. of in the same category as the crankbait. Cause I throw the eight inch mag draft on the seven ninety five, which is their swim bait rod, but it's not really that stout in my opinion. It's, it's got a lot of bend to it, but it's just like they bite it and you set the hook and it loads up and they just, they just stay pinned. I've just seen, I've seen it with, braid where a big hook like an a-rig hook or a-rig hooks aren't that big but um like the mag draft where you set the hook with braid and you rip their mouth it's like i just want i just want the puncture and then just like you said winch them to the boat but obviously you're drag them to the boat as fast as you can but not like very fast and i just i feel like with the with the fluorocarbon there's just so much more give and they can just they stay pegged a lot better Hmm. but it's total preference like i've fished no, no. Who throw, like matt allen he throws braid to fluorocarbon or mono leader for the a rig and you've seen all the damage they've done on it like it's just it's total preference no but i like i want to try that too because i like that idea because that might be that might help me with my umbrella game too um and it just means i have to buy, my, buy more stuff which is i'm fine with you can matt, bar, you can borrow some of my <laughs> i just ordered dude. a thousand yards of 20 pound red label Dude, I ordered a shit ton of line over Black Friday. I think I ordered like a thousand dollars worth of line just so I can like last year I didn't do it and I screwed up and I paid more because through the year you buy that stuff. But I just bought the big spools just to be able to get everything dialed in for yep. this year. But like- um, I want to make sure we plug everything for you. Um, so pro staff Dobbins. Yes. You want to make sure you give them a plug? Of course. Plugging them right here. OK, well, there you go, guys. Yep. OK, very professional. <laughs> But I'll link that in the episode description. Um, Get him anyone, Jake's. Jake's, yes. Jake's thank has you. a ton. Jake's does have a good Dobbin selection. Mm-hmm. So, and again, guys, Jake's is always listed in the episode description as well. Along with, uh, we're going to put Matt's uh, social stuff handles, his Instagram, his Facebook, his YouTube channel. Everything will be in the episode description down below. Um, we're going to get him to do that this year. I promise, guys. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah it's going to happen this Maybe year. 2023 year. There you go. One video a year. That that'll work. <laughs> and it won't be on the res. I'll go to like I'll go to like Frederick or something. Go to like Fred. If if you smoke a ten pad like Frederick, you'll break the internet on your channel easily if you do that. There's like I mean, one a year that gets caught out there. It's because no one knows how to fish that place. That's the problem. They're there. They're oh, 100% I'm, sure there. I'm sure there's more than one. But it's um, usually in the spawn when somebody catches one. That's because so we kind of, which is kind of cool. We broke the story finally that there are blueback in that place where we had, you know, Halliker on, we had you, and then we had the guy that runs the bait shop and he showed us pictures of them. There's a massive population of blueback. And then he go. And so my point is like those fish, if they're not spawning, they're chasing blueback the whole time. And so I think during the blueback spawn there, that is when you have a chance of catching, you know, the biggest one that swims. Like, I don't think it's going to be the spawn there because the, I just think the spawning habitat's so funky to try to get them. It, maybe you can. I just feel like it's going to be the blueback spawn. I think it's but, too clear. It's really clear, so they spawn super deep. But and I it, think and the grass is so, perfect. Yeah, it's good spawning. I think that for that's probably part of the reason that it's got such a healthy population of fish is because of the. I think the spawning like habitat is perfect yeah yeah what so what i meant is like there's not like this this five foot flat oh that yeah, you yeah. can power pull down and look at them it's it's basically they're probably in like four feet and then you can they can drop to 20 feet mm-hmm. and so it's really hard i think to set up your boat yes really good to try to sight fish for mm-hmm. them there. yeah absolutely um, but, yeah, but then again like i don't know i'm i'm no expert in, in bed fishing oh, so- bed fishing is easy it's like hunting yeah so hunting's easy well no like if you think of it like i'm not a hunter so no no, like um you know clothes how you how you set your clothes up like i think that's huge like i think there's a picture of me yeah there's on the youtube channel we caught a a four and a half on a bed and i basically just took my shirt off i had a camo shirt underneath we 
we move the boat so the sun is over there so i'm not casting a shadow and yeah you just then you just junk fish it and then i mean i personally think it's that easy don't get married to one bait and just cycle through baits until you get a reaction out of it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like live scope with your eyes. If you want to, if you want to make that analogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, I've just, the only, the best way I've known to bed fish is just get them pissed off. Once you find, once you find the one spot in the bed, it's just like, if you can make that repeated cast on that one spot that she's that female or male is like really targeting, then it's Especially yeah. if she gets like right on top of it and you can pop a bait right in front of her face. And, and, and so everyone has their own style. What I like to do is I'll take either a glide bait, a bluegill imitator. That's really big. Like Matt lures, take the hooks off of it. Cause my biggest thing with that is depending again, if it's a tournament, you might hook them on the outside mm-hmm. with a treble hook. But the fact is I don't want to hook them with that. Even if I could get them in the mouth, cause they could still shake it and piss them off with that. And then throw a fluke or something else in there. So, like, if you take a if you take a mag draft, I bet you took the treble hook off and you just just drug that into the bed, and then you threw a tube in there, you could probably get them. But yeah, it's about getting those fish just so pissed off and then force feeding them what you want. Mm-hmm. I think. No, that's smart. I've definitely seen throwing a glide bait into a bed, and it, it they get a total different reaction from a glide bait than a little Texas rig. Dude, and that's what's so crazy about I think the live scope and big bait thing is like you really realize like they get either pissed or curious when you throw a nine, ten, twelve inch bait in there. It's insane the reaction from fish when that gets pulled into their area. Yeah, it's just they're very territorial. I think. When they're when they're spawning now when they're when they're offshore and stuff I don't think it's a territory thing I think it's just they're there to feed and they're not like oh get out of my area they're like you're come they're more like come into my area <laughs> come over here so I can eat you kind of thing but yeah it's uh they they get curious on a ten inch glide bait no they really do all right well Matt you know again thank you so much for coming back on I really appreciate it hopefully we'll see you down at the Richmond Expo we get you out in there and then yeah feel free dude if you ever want to come back on the show you're more than welcome to uh guys again please like and subscribe to the channel you know we're the fastest growing outdoor fishing podcast in the DC metro area we'll see you next time on fishing the DMV bye you're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.